from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the library's Center for the Book, which is its reading promotion arm. And we promote books and reading throughout and literacy and libraries throughout the country, uh, largely through two networks. We have affiliated centers in every state and also national reading promotion partners, which consist of organizations which are interested, we hope, in promoting books and reading. Here at the Library of Congress, we're deeply involved in the National Book Festival, which is an annual event. Uh, the center not only works on the author program, but we sponsor basically something called the Pavilion of the States. And if you've not been to the book festival, uh, if you have been, you know what the Pavilion of the States is. It's the largest pavilion where all the states are here, our state centers are here, and state libraries, and they have tables and they talk about how they promote authors and writing and books uh, in their states, and it's a very, very uh, busy pavilion. We also sponsor talks such as this one. The Books and Beyond series focuses largely, well, almost entirely, on books that have some kind of special connection with the Library of Congress, uh, either through the collections, which our speaker will mention today. He relied heavily on the library's collections, particularly the manuscript collections, uh, but also uh, books coming out of special projects that the library is involved in. So we're pleased you're here, and there are a couple of still some seats in the middle up here, so uh, we're going to be just about right, I think. Uh, all of the Books and Beyond programs uh, are videotaped for our website, and today is no exception. Uh, that means I'd like to ask you to turn off uh, all things electronic. Uh, our format is roughly uh, about a 40-minute talk from our speaker, then time for questions and answers, and book signings are very much a part of the Books and Beyond series. In the signing, uh, Doug will be signing the books out in the foyer just beyond the, um, on the other side. Uh, as I said, uh, many of our, most of our Books and Beyond talks are now available uh, on our website. There also is a Books and Beyond Club Facebook where we keep track of our speakers and encourage you to uh, sign on and learn what's coming up and make comments uh, about talks that, uh, that you have seen. I would like to say that we are especially privileged today to have an author whose book has been so well reviewed. It's also a topic in which there's widespread interest. Uh, he and I were chatting a little earlier about the run that he's on, not only with talks around the Washington area, but the wonderful run of good reviews this book is receiving. And it had a, a front page review, if I'm not mistaken, at, in the New York Times book review a week before last. And he tells me that uh, even yesterday he was on the road talking to employees at the CIA. So you can see that this is a topic that uh, is of great interest uh, to all of us. Our speaker is uh, Doug Waller, Douglas Waller, a former veteran correspondent for Newsweek and Time, and he has rep and he reported on the CIA for six years. Uh, he also covered the Pentagon, the State Department, the White House, and the Congress. Before reporting for Newsweek and Time, he served eight years as a legislative assistant on the staffs of Representative Edward Markey and Senator William Proxmire. Uh, he is the author of the bestsellers, The Commandos, The Inside Story of America's Secret Soldiers, which chronicled U.S. Special Operations Forces with a lineage tracing back to the OSS, our topic, one of our topics today, and also the author of Big Red, The Three-Month Voyage of a Trident Nuclear Submarine. He is the author of A Question of Loyalty, General Billy Mitchell and the Court Martial that Gripped the Nation, another of his books that depended heavily on the Library of Congress, in particular the Mitchell Papers and the Manuscript Division. And, and it was a critically acclaimed biography of the, of the World War II general. I will leave it to our author, Douglas Waller, to begin telling us all about his book and the central character, Wild Bill Donovan. I'm pleased to introduce Doug Waller. Doug? <laughs> 
Thanks, John. Uh, it's really nice, from, nice to be here. It's kind of old home week for me, uh, being back at the Library of Congress, because during the uh, research for the uh, Donovan book, for one year I spent every Saturday, every single Saturday in the manuscript uh, division room going through, I think it was something like 15 sets of papers. Uh, Don Van A, who's an eminent historian here at the Library of Congress, was my mentor. One of the things you discover uh, if you're doing histories or biographies is you need to have an archivist uh, helping you out in the collections. Otherwise, you can get totally lost. And uh, Don is a bulldog uh, when it comes to the collections in the manuscript division room. Uh, when I wasn't in the manuscript room, I was in the main reading room uh, over in the Jefferson Building, although I have to admit, I don't know if other historians admit this either, I had a hard time paying attention in there because I kept on looking up at the beautiful artwork all the time. Never saw any hawks up there or birds <laughs> or eagles or whatever, never any, uh, never any wildlife up there, but the, uh, the, uh, uh, the view is just spectacular. Wild Bill Donovan. It's a book really with three stories in it. The first is a very compelling biography of a truly heroic figure whose life uh, met a lot of personal tragedies. It's also a spy story, uh, the tale of some very daring operations that occurred during World War II. And it's a tale of Washington political intrigue at the highest levels of government. And that was the part of it, I guess, being a journalist that interest, interested me the most. Start with uh, the personal story. For Donovan, it's a very, very rich one. In fact, I've always said I would have loved to have been a reporter back then in the 1940s covering him. And interestingly, I probably would have covered him. Donovan liked reporters. Uh, he leaked to them all the time. He, uh, they worked on his staff as spies and propagandists. Before he formed the OSS, he would go overseas on informal uh, intelligence collection missions and sometimes worked part-time as a correspondent uh, for different newspapers, earned a little money on the side. He, uh, he was not a particularly tall person, only about five foot nine. Uh, Mary, uh, let's see, Elizabeth McIntosh, one of his female agents, thought he, when he headed up the OSS, he looked kind of penguin-shaped. Uh, in fact, he told her that one time, he didn't really appreciate it. Uh, Mary Bancroft, another one of his agents, said he looked like a Cupid doll. Don't anybody ask me what a Cupid doll looks like, I never looked it up. Uh, he slept five hours or less a night. He could speed read at least three books a week. Uh, he was an excellent ballroom dancer. He loved to sing Irish songs. He would go to uh, New York and collect all the latest sheet music from uh, Broadway so he could learn the words. He didn't smoke, rarely drank. He enjoyed fine dining, which unfortunately put on the pounds for him uh, in his later years. He spent lavishly with no concept for a dollar. In fact, when he was out on trips or in the field, his aides always carried money because he was always mooching quarters and dollars off of them. He was witty, but he never laughed out loud, rarely ever told a dirty joke. He never showed anger. He instead let it boil inside him. Uh, he was rakishly handsome. Uh, particularly as a young man. He had bright blue eyes that women found absolutely captivating. Uh, but his life also was filled with tragedy. His daughter, his granddaughter, one of his granddaughters, and his daughter-in-law all died at uh, early ages. He was born New Year's Day, 1883, in Buffalo, New York's poor Irish First Ward. First he thought he'd become a priest. Of course, in most Irish families, uh, it was always assumed that one of the sons would become a priest, and Donovan thought that would be him. Uh, turned out he wasn't really cut out for the cloth, so instead he went to Columbia University, was qu quarterback the football team at Columbia's senior year, went to Columbia Law School. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was a classmate of his. Roosevelt later liked to say that they knew each other at Columbia Law School, but Donovan said that was a bunch of baloney. Roosevelt was at a much higher social strata uh, than Donovan was at law school. He returned to Buffalo, married into Protestant wealth, married one of the most wealthy women in Buffalo. Uh, during World War I, he commanded a battalion first in the 69th Irish Regiment, which was a very famous New, New York regiment. Later, he became the, uh, the brigade's, uh, I'm sorry, the re regiment's uh, executive officer and its on-ground commander. He was absolutely fearless in combat. His, uh, the chaplain of the 69th Regiment, Father Francis Duffy, said Donovan was the only guy he'd ever met who really enjoyed combat. 
Okay, he won the Medal of Honor uh, in World War I. That's where he also got his nickname Wild Bill. Before they went to war, uh, and they were still training in France, Donovan was uh, really a, uh, a brutal commander, very, very tough. He would have boxing matches with the gloves off for his men just to toughen them up. And after one particular, because he knew they were going to be, uh, you know, experiencing just horrific combat in this attrition war, warfare that you saw in World War I, but after one particular grueling uh, exercise where he had run them over up and down hills and through obstacle courses, they all collapsed on the ground, just exhausted and panting. And he stood up there and he said, you know, what the heck's the matter with you? I'm 35 years old carrying the same pack as you, and you don't see me out of breath. From be, uh, far behind the battalion, somebody shouted out. He never figured out who it was. But we're not as wild as you are, Bill. From that day on, Wild Bill stuck. He claimed that he didn't like the nickname because it ran counter to the spy, cool, collected, quiet, professional image that he wanted to project. But his wife, Ruth, knew that he really did like it. Uh, he enjoyed being called Wild Bill. He returned to New York a hero. Uh, he became assistant attorney general in the Coolidge administration during the Roaring Twenties. His goal was to become attorney general of the, the United States. He wanted that position, uh, really wanted it. And he thought Herbert Hoover, who followed Coolidge, uh, had promised him the attorney generalship. And in, in fact, Hoover had. But Hoover reneged on the promise. The Ku Klux Klan, very, very powerful political party back then, plus Democrats in the Senate, Donovan was a prominent Republican, uh, vowed to block his nomination. So uh, Hoover instead uh, backed off, reneged on the promise. It, it disappointed Donovan greatly. Uh, he never forgave Herbert Hoover for that. He moved to New York City, formed a very prominent law firm, the Donovan Leisure Law Firm, which is what it became eventually, earned millions as a Wall Street lawyer. Then in 1932, he ran for governor of New York, uh, again as a Republican. He was a conservative uh, Republican, anti-New Dealer. He thought uh, the New Deal was a communist plot to take over the U U.S. government. His ultimate goal was to be the nation's first Irish Catholic president. Okay. And New York was uh, the ideal stepping stone for it, as it was Franklin Roosevelt was running, of course, in 1932 and had been governor of New York. Donovan was running against Roosevelt's lieutenant governor, a guy named Herbert Lehman. He ended up running as much against Roosevelt as he did Lehman during the campaign. He said some pretty nasty things about uh, Roosevelt. At one point, he uh, accused him of being, quote, crafty. Okay, now back then, those were fighting war. That was pretty incendiary. Or at one time he said Roosevelt was a Hyde Park faker because Roosevelt claimed that he was a simple gentleman farmer from Hyde Park, and Donovan thought that was a bunch of baloney. Donovan lost the election, got trounced in it, uh, just like Her Herbert Hoover did in 1932. Turned out he was a horrible campaigner. Okay. If he was in this room talking to you, he would hold, he would captivate your attention, particularly with those bright blue eyes. He had a very magnetic, charismatic personality. He could really turn on the Irish charm. In front of a large audience on the stump, he was even more wooden than Al Gore. I mean, he was just, he was terrible. In fact, his, uh, the guy running with him as a lieutenant governor, his running mate, Truby Davison, thought he was such a lousy campaigner that Davison thought he should have been running for governor and they should have made Donovan the lieutenant gubernatorial candidate and out of the way so he was never in front of the public. It's amazing that Roosevelt eventually picked Donovan as his top spy ma master, considering the two uh, disagreed strongly on domestic issues uh, and they'd fought each other in, uh, in New York politics. But we're talking now 1940-41, Roosevelt's building up the country, preparing the country for the war he sees uh, looming over the horizon. Donovan was one of the few, well, not of the few, but he was part of the internationalist wing of the Republican Party. He believed that uh, the country needed to prepare for war, needed to mobilize his defense. In fact, he wanted to get into the fight, too. He wanted to command an infantry division. At one time, he sent a memo to Roosevelt and said uh, what we should do is recruit uh, older men for the war, uh, guys my age, you know, in, in their late 50s because we've we're more seasoned and we can fight better. Roosevelt thought that was a silly idea. Uh, but Donovan and Roosevelt saw each other 
as having a common cause here with preparing the country for war. Roosevelt sent Donovan on two diplomatic missions in 1940 and 41. The first one in 1940 was to England to assess whether Britain could survive the Nazi, Nazi onslaught. You know, was Britain going to come out of this alive? Donovan got access to top British officials, uh, top military officials, collected literally hundreds of pounds of documents uh, from London, met with Roosevelt, met with some of the spy people at that point, came back with it all to Washington and concluded, yes, Britain could survive the war, but it would need U.S. Uh, material aid uh, in order to survive. The second trip he took for Roosevelt was in late 1940, early 1941. He spent more time with Churchill this time. Churchill started to realize this, that this Irish-American, which at first he didn't, you know, he didn't know, you know, was kind of suspicious of, uh, was actually or could be a close ally. So Churchill uh, arranged for Donovan to tour the Balkans and Eastern Europe and the Middle East. In fact, he went on a British plane. He had uh, British es escorts taking him around. They paid all the bills. Uh, Ian Fleming, you know, James Bond, was his et one of his escorts and would file reports back to London on what exactly Donovan was doing in, uh, in these, at these different countries. What he was doing was telling Balkan leaders and Middle East, le Middle East leaders that Franklin Roosevelt did not intend to let Britain lose this war. So you better decide uh, which, which side you're on. It better be the winning side, which is the ally side. Roosevelt was just delighted with this message uh, going out throughout the Middle East and the Balkans. So was, uh, so was uh, Churchill, too, and Churchill actually even more so. The State Department was a little miffed over it. In fact, uh, at one point they debated internally whether Donovan should be prosecuted for violating the Logan Act, which makes it a crime for a private U.S. citizen to negotiate on behalf of the U.S. government overseas. Franklin Roosevelt, however, uh, was absolutely delighted with, uh, with Donovan's trip. Because keep in mind, we're talking 1940-41. Roosevelt has no foreign intelligence service to speak of uh, telling him what's happening overseas. The Army and the Navy had very, very small intelligence collection units overseas, and mainly they were dumping grounds for poor performing officers. The State Department had practically no intelligence collecting capability among its embassies overseas. Uh, so Roosevelt was going into major foreign policy decisions in 40 and 41, things like Lend-Lease, how much to supply uh, the British, how he's going to get around U.S. laws that uh, constricted that supply or f forbade it. And he was facing re-election. He was going, uh, uh, going up for an unprecedented third term. He's making these major foreign policy decisions overseas practically blind to what lay ahead uh, for him overseas or what was really happening overseas. And in fact, it worried uh, Roosevelt so much that he would at times become physically ill uh, over it. When Donovan comes back from the, uh, the two missions to Europe, that's when our spy story begins. In July 1941, Roosevelt signs a one-page executive order setting up the, the coordinator of information with a very bland sounding name. It was a very vague document. It just said that Colonel Donovan, he had been a colonel in World War I, you still return that, retain that title. Colonel Donovan is going to uh, collect information for me of national importance and he's going to do other unspecified things. In fact, the document was so vague that the rest of uh, Roosevelt's cabinet started scratching their head like, you know, what the heck is this guy up to? What are they doing? And Roosevelt had to send out follow-up memos to explain uh, exactly what he wanted Donovan to do. Donovan's spy organization, the coordinator of information, which later became, was renamed the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS as we know it, started out with one person, Wild Bill Donovan. Okay. He liked to tell friends that he started out with minus zero. Uh, and it really was. In the beginning, he was kind of like a player in a pickup basketball game, looking for agents and operations and programs, really anywhere he could find it. So, for example, the Phillips Lamp Company, uh, they may be in, still in business for all I know, but back then, they had salesmen that sold lamps overseas all over the world. Donovan privately contracted with them so that the Phillips Lamps salesmen, when they were making calls, sales calls, for example, in occupied countries, the Axis occupied, 
they'd also collect uh, information that would be useful for Donovan's organization, military intelligence information perhaps that they saw. The Eastman Kodak Company, you know, my day we, it was all, all with the brownie cameras and now I think they have the disposable cameras. Back then they had thousands of camera clubs around the United States. Donovan arranged for Eastman Kodak to send him photos tourists had taken from the camera clubs of militarily important sites overseas so his people could start analyzing them. Uh, Pan American Airways, you know, Pan Am. It, uh, he arranged secret contracts with Pan Am ticket agents in Africa to monitor the uh, movements of Nazis in that, uh, in that continent. The project was codenamed Cigar. Donovan went for practically any wild idea anybody could ever think up, and he thought up a lot of wild ideas himself. His code number was 109, which was actually, and that was the number you'd see on the secret OSS documents, uh, 109 always. That was actually the room number uh, for his office, in, uh, which was located in a headquarters on Navy, Navy Hill, which is next to what, what is now the State Department. His secretaries actually had another code name for him. They called him Seabiscuit because, like the racehorse, he always seemed to be running around every which way, and they could never keep track of him. He kept $2,000 in his desk drawer at all times to pay sources of information uh, around Washington, and he'd always be darting off to different parts of Washington for secret meetings with these sources. He had a research and de development chief, a guy named Stanley Lovell, who was a very famous New England inventor of his time. Donovan called him his Professor Moriarty after the uh, Sherlock Holmes character. And Lovell invented all the gadgets for the OSS pistols with silencers, uh, the miniature cameras, you know, tiny pencil-like explosive devices. One of the experiments Donovan was very, very interested in was truth drugs. Uh, he really got into that, and so did Stanley Lovell. One time they uh, uh, decided to test the truth drugs on an unwitting mafia thug, okay, a guy named Little Augie. Okay. Uh, a, an OSS officer who had worked as a New York City cop invited New Little Augie up to his apartment uh, for some smokes and a chat. Okay, laced within the cigarettes were the truth drug. And so Little Augie's puffing away on these cigarettes. Finally, he gets a silly grin on his face and starts chuckling and talking about all the mob hits he's carried out and his work with Lucky Luciano and how he's bribed this congressman or that congressman. Fortunately for little Augie, his secrets were safe with Donovan because they never brought him to trial because that would expose the truth drug. He had other kinds of wild ideas. For example, he proposed one time to uh, Franklin Roosevelt that he have a button on his desk that he could push at any time and instantly communicate with every radio in America to alert them if the Japanese were attacking Los Angeles or the Germans were attacking New York. Roosevelt ignored the idea. Uh, but Roosevelt was open to all these ideas. He considered Donovan kind of his spark plug for thinking out of the box. I mean, he had George Marshall, Admiral King, Hap Arnold of the Air Force. That was Roosevelt's inner circle of advisors, uh, the, his inner war council. Donovan was never part of that inner circle. But he was kind of the guy uh, outside thinking off-the-wall ideas. And Roosevelt loved him. He was kind of, Roosevelt was kind of a spy buff himself. He'd been ever since he was a, uh, a young boy. So he was intrigued by espionage and intelligence operations. So for example, one of the ideas that Stanley Lovell's men tested was fitting bats, you know, bats that fly in the eaves of buildings, with incendiary devices. And what they were going to do is they were going to drop these bats from a plane over Tokyo. The bats would fly into the eaves of the wooden and paper houses in Tokyo and burn down all the homes. Terrific idea. Eleanor Roosevelt had been told this. A friend had told her this, this just might work. And Eleanor passed it on to Franklin. Franklin thought it was kind of cool. Passed it on to Donovan. So Stanley Lovell went out to some desert. They flew a plane over there. They fitted these uh, bats with his incendiary devices, dropped them out of the plane. Unfortunately, they all sank like a stone. Didn't work. Uh, but Donovan uh, thought, it, you know, that was the kind of ideas that he would test out, and he was totally unfazed by the failures. In addition to being also the father of modern American espionage, Donovan was also the father of information warfare. And by information warfare, we're talking about psychological operations. You see them today that's in cyber warfare, things that psych out the enemy. In Donovan's day, 
the technology for this was fairly crude. It basically consisted of rumors, leaflets, uh, radios, and, and newspapers. So, for example, he would have uh, his agents plant rumors in the New York Times, the Associated Press, and overseas papers that the top Nazi leaders were uh, fleeing to South America and leaving the Germans high and dry. Uh, Marlena Dietrich, very sultry uh, German singer, uh, sang for propaganda broadcasts that Donovan beamed in to German soldiers. There were also the League of Lonely Women leaflets and these were dropped over German uh, soldiers. And what this told them was that their wives and girlfriends back home belonged to the League of Lonely Women, and they were having sex with the other, their comrades that were coming back on leave. Nobody could ever figure out what kind of effect that had. Another thing they, uh, another thing they couldn't figure out what the effect was, they dropped mail bags over Germany. Inside of them were stuffed with poison pen letters that OSS officers had written in German uh, with addresses uh, they'd gotten from German directories, telephone directories, in them hoping that uh, German people would pick up the mail bags, give them to the post office, figuring they'd been lost, and the mail would get delivered. Again, they never, never really figured out whether that was going to work or did work or not. Stanley Lovell had an idea at one point. He concocted hormones that they figured if, if there's some way they could inject it into Hitler's vegetables, they didn't know where those vegetables were, but they could inject it into Hitler's vegetables, it would make his mustache fall off, and he'd speak, <laughs> he would speak in a falsetto voice, which had definitely been a bummer for the Fuhrer, right? <laughs> uh, Donovan turned out to be a horrible uh, manager, a horrible organizer. In the four years he ran the OSS, he violated practically every rule you learn in Harvard Business School or Public Administration School. Uh, and it would drive his senior people nuts. And in fact, at one point, about a half dozen of his inner circle staged what was called later the Palace Revolt. It was basically a coup. They tried to oust him. Basically, what they wanted to do was move him up and out as a broad overseer, and they would run the uh, OSS organization because he seemed to be constantly on the move. He was constantly traveling all the time and never at his desk doing paperwork. In fact, there was a, a saying in the OSS that if they had a private out front raising the flag up and down every time Donovan was in and out, he'd have to be there on 24-hour duty because he was always in and out. Donovan, who had launched enough coups by this point, could smell one that was being launched against himself, and he squished it like a bug. Uh, and the uh, palace revolt went away. Even so, he was a very charismatic leader with his own uh, agents overseas, and he was overseas most of the time. They revered him. He rarely ever issued a command overseas. He usually just asked, and they, they would follow him loyally. And eventually, Donovan built up an organization of over 10,000 espionage agents, special operations commandos, research analysts, uh, administration personnel in stations all over the world. Again, a fairly remarkable achievement, again, because he started out with just one guy, which was Wild Bill Donovan. They mounted covert operations, for example, before the, the invasion of North Africa in November 1942, provided a lot of good information for Eisenhower's forces on beach conditions uh, that the uh, forces would face when they landed at North Africa, a lot of information on you know, different factions within North Africa. They failed, though, to organize the Vichy French in North Africa so that they would accept Eisenhower's forces in, and so in the first couple of weeks there, you know, there were some ferocious bat battles with the Vichy French. Uh, he had operations in Sicily and Italy. His Italian operations had a lot of failures. He had a lot of problems in, in Italy. But keep in mind, Mark Clark's Fifth Army had a lot of problems in Italy, too. I mean, that was a slow attrition warfare that was a wage there. He mounted extensive operations in the Balkans, uh, organizing resistance and supplying resistance uh, against Hitler's occupation army, particularly in Yugoslavia and in Greece. In Asia, he, his men operated in Burma and China against the Japanese. Uh, Douglas MacArthur would never let him in his uh, theater, the Southwest Pacific Theater, neither would Chester Nimitz. Both of them didn't think they had any use for Donovan's people uh, over there, so they basically only accepted maybe a few propagandists and a few frogmen, and that was it. Uh, it for Normandy, though, Donovan uh, 
had extensive operations, his research and analysis people, uh, who originally started here in the Library of Congress, by the way, uh, produced a lot of valuable information on beach conditions of the Normandy coast. Uh, their target analysis people did a lot of uh, work for Hap Arnold's Air Force identifying targets uh, in Germany and occupied France. And Jonathan dropped in uh, hundreds of commandos, operational group commandos, they called them OGs, or Jedburgh uh, commandos after the training site in Scotland where they trained, who landed behind the lines before the invasion and even afterwards to organize French resistance against the, uh, against the uh, Germans. Incidentally, Donovan also loved to go in on the landings, the Allied landings. He went into the ones in Sicily, Italy, uh, and also in Normandy, much to the chagrin of his own staff, who thought that was no place for the, uh, America's top spy master to be right at the front, you know, with the fire coming overhead. In fact, George Marshall thought he had Donovan banned from the Normandy landing, so did Eisenhower, but Ma Donovan managed to, w to talk his way aboard a Navy cruiser and land at Utah Beach this, uh, the day after the initial wave. He had a grand time. Uh, Messerschmitts came over and strafed his Jeep, and he had to roll over and escape that. He got pinned down by a German machine gun uh, nest, but it was you know, quite a lark for him. The, uh, it took almost two years for Donovan's OSS to really build itself up into a professional organization and really get into the fight. It may seem like a long time, but keep in mind it also took the U.S. Army quite a while to build itself up as a professional organization in World War II and get itself really into the fight. Uh, and Donovan also had his share of intelligence failures like we see with the CIA today. One of the most uh, spectacular failures he had was the vessel case. He thought he had the silver bullet agent uh, planted in the Vatican, codenamed Vessel, who was giving him transcripts, verbatim transcripts, of private, sensitive diplomatic conversations that Pope Pius was having with other envoys, with his own envoys stationed in uh, Japan, and with uh, Japanese envoys. Turned out Vessel, though, was an Italian pornographer uh, who had a very, very vivid imagination and a talent for inventing dialogue. But he snookered Donovan uh, and his organization. You know, uh, just they bought him hook, line, and sinker. Not unlike what you see today, for example, in the lead up to the Iraq War with uh, the silver bullet agent that the CIA thought they had, which was Curveball who was giving them what they thought was ironclad uh, information on uh, biological weapons capability. And in fact, uh, there was an interview in the, uh, uh, a British newspaper just recently where Curveball, in fact, admitted that he made it all up. He was a fabricator. So history really does repeat itself. Uh, but again, as I say, as the U.S. Army improved, Donovan's organization improved. But this is also a story of political intrigue. Okay. Donovan liked to say he had enemies in Washington as fierce as Adolf Hitler in Europe. He had ferocious fights with J. Edgar Hoover. Hoover thought he, Donovan's organization was the biggest collection of amateurs he'd ever seen. And in fact, in the beginning, it was the biggest collection of amateurs anybody had ever seen. It took a while for it to professionalize. Hoover mounted spy operations against the OSS uh, and its senior people and against Donovan literally until the day he died. Uh, he was constantly snooping on him. Donovan was, uh, had moles in Hoover's FBI that were feeding him information on what, uh, what Hoover was doing. The Pentagon at first bitterly fought uh, the formation of the OSS. Uh, and eventually the Army Intelligence set up its own secret spy unit. They nicknamed it the Pond, which spied behind Donovan's back. Not only spied against uh, the Axis, but spied against Donovan, his men, even, the, uh, even his men's wives they spied against. Uh, in fact, they, if you look in the Pons documents, they used to call the OSS the Dons. I don't know what that meant. But uh, you know, they were always constantly monitoring what the Dons were doing around the world. Nelson Rockefeller, okay, governor of New York, vice president of the United States at one point. Back in, the, uh, in Roosevelt's administration, he was the coordinator of Latin American affairs in charge of propaganda in Latin America, a job and a mission that Donovan thought his OSS should be in charge of and its propaganda operation uh, should be in charge of. 
He had fierce fights with uh, uh, Nelson Rockefeller over turf in Latin America. In fact, at one point they got into such an argument at the State Department that Donovan threatened to throw Rockefeller out the window. I think they were on the second floor. Uh, in any given war, generals and admirals fight among themselves all the time. And that was certainly the case in World War II. I mean, Ad, uh, Eisenhower had uh, fierce battles uh, with uh, you know, top commanders uh, under him, fierce battles with the British. The battles, though, that Donovan had with uh, the War Department and Army generals and Navy admirals were particularly fierce because they just didn't understand what this guy was all about. I mean, when he went to them and he started talking about espionage operations and covert warfare and League of Lonely Women and everything, they just really couldn't figure him out, and they found him genuinely disturbing uh, to their operations. Donovan also had a penchant for not taking no for an answer. So when a uh, commander would block something he was going to do, he usually made an end run around the commander to his superior officer to try and get it reversed, which doesn't win you many friends in the Pentagon. So for example, he would go to the commander of the Navy, uh, the admiral in charge of the Navy, say, I need more officers uh, from the Navy for my, for my unit. And the uh, admiral would say no. So Frank Knox, I mean, Donovan would go to Frank Knox, who's the secretary of the Navy, an old Republican pal. And Frank Knox would call up the admiral to try and pressure him to give up the officers. Again, that doesn't win you friends among the sea service. One time he was at a cocktail party in Washington talking to an admiral, and he had his agents uh, burglarize the admiral's office, steal documents off his desk. And the agents brought it back to Donovan so Donovan can show the admiral and show off what his agents could do. I never was able to determine what the reaction was of the admiral, but I got a feeling he may have been nonplussed by it. Donovan would also show up at Pentagon meetings. He'd always usually show up. It was a senior officer. is very often late. He would come in. His uh, uniform would be immaculately tailored from Wetzel's in New York. Very often, he would only wear his Congressional Medal of Honor, which he won in World War II, that ribbon on his uniform, just as a not-so-subtle reminder to the admirals and the generals in the room with their rows of ribbon and all that fruit salad up there that he had the only medal that counted. When he was in the field, however, he could be, as one agent called, incorrigibly civilian. Okay? He would all, his fatigues would always be very, very rumpled. One, uh, uh, several times you'd catch him in the field, and he'd be wearing a paisley ascot with his fatigues. I don't think they let the generals do that nowadays, but, uh, but he did it back then. And it was, kind of, again, a not so subtle reminder to anybody else in the field that he was an unconventional warrior. And this group he was commanding was an unconventional group. For the Allies, uh, the British played an integral role in setting up the OSS for Donovan and helping him set it up. In fact, Donovan's relationship with the British in many respects was even closer than it was with, than with his own War Department. Even so, he had fierce battles uh, with the British, uh, British intelligence, special operations, and Winston Churchill over turf, you know, who would spy where around the world and who would conduct operations uh, in what parts of the world. Donovan, at one point, even mounted spy operations against the British to find out what Churchill was doing. Churchill's men, if you go to the archives in London, uh, had a very vigorous spy operation monitoring bon Donovan to figure out what he was up to around the world. Our other ally, Chiang Kai-shek in Sh China, Donovan uh, enlisted the help of a guy named Cornelius V. Starr, who was a big publisher back then. And Starr set up a newspaper in Chongqing for him that Donovan uh, bankrolled a half million dollars he put into it uh, and brought in his OSS officers to pose as reporters. And they filed stories for the newspaper, but they also collected intelligence on the side and filed it on what the Japanese were doing in China and, more importantly, what Chiang Kai-shek was doing in China, too. The Soviets, another ally of ours, at one point, Finnish intelligence uh, offered Donovan 1,500 uh, NKGB and Soviet military documents that had uh, NKGB codes in them. And Donovan uh, eventually bought the, bought the codes for $62,500. When the State Department learned of that, they were up in arms over it because the Soviets were our allies. And they got Franklin Roosevelt to order Donovan to return the codes uh, to the Soviets. 
And so Donovan had them all packed up in boxes, had one of his aides take it to the Washington Embassy here. Andre Gromico was the ambassador then, and he looked on this these bunch of boxes very, very skeptically uh, with kind of a look on his face that said, you expect me to believe that you haven't copied these and looked at them all over. <laughs> uh, and, they, and Donovan said, no, I assure you, you know, we haven't. Of course, he didn't believe that cock and bull story. Uh, and it turned, and the Soviets, uh, of course, immediately changed their codes when they learned that the Finns had them and were selling them. And it's a good thing they did because the enterprising Finns also sold the, sold the codes to the Japanese for $70,000. The free market was always alive and well during World War II. Donovan, however, eventually couldn't overcome his political enemies. He had drafted a uh, post war central intelligence plan. Uh, a plan to set up a CIA after the war, and he wanted to lead it. Walter Trohan, who was a reporter for the Washington Times Herald, which was owned by the uh, McCormick Patterson chain, uh, that was Colonel Robert McCormick in Chicago and Sissy Patterson in Washington, was virulently anti Roosevelt, despised Roosevelt, and Roosevelt despised the chain. Trohan had been slipped a copy of uh, Donovan's highly secret post-war CIA plan, and he published it in the Chicago Tribune, the Washington Times Herald, among, the other t among two papers, and wrote a very, very inflammatory story, accused Donovan of setting up a, quote, American Gestapo that was going to spy not only on people overseas, but Americans at home. Now, if you called anybody or any organization a Gestapo back, in, back then, that was, uh, you know, pretty incendiary words. So it's, uh, it pretty much sank. Donovan's plan with uh, Roosevelt, uh, and particularly with Marshall. He also had a problem. Uh, Hoover spread a particularly nasty rumor with uh, Harry Truman's staff. He, uh, Hoover had an agent spread the rumor with Harry Truman's staff that Donovan was sleeping with his daughter-in-law. Yeah. Uh, there was no truth to it that I could determine. I researched it uh, you know, quite heavily. Uh, Donovan's daughter-in-law, he treated as a daughter and only as a daughter. In fact, she became a surrogate daughter to him when his, his first daughter died. Uh, but Donovan did have a number of affairs and a number of mistresses, which were his common knowledge uh, in Washington uh, and in Buffalo and other parts, and even military intelligence knew about it. So uh, it was given some credence by people uh, back then. In addition, the pond, remember that's the Pentagon spy unit, they managed to arrange for a 59-page report to be placed on Truman's desk that had been written ostensibly by uh, an Army colonel on the White House staff there. Actually, it was written by, by the pond, uh, which accused Donovan's organization of all kinds of uh, misdeeds and blown operation and corruption. They even accused him. Uh, of staging a sex orgy in India at one point. You also had the problem here that Truman and Donovan just really didn't like each other. Particularly, Truman really didn't like Donovan. There was bad chemistry between the two guys. On the one hand, you had a, uh, a millionaire Wall Street Republican lawyer, and on the other hand, you had a failed Missouri haberdasher who was a staunch Democrat. Okay, they, they, just, uh, they just weren't going get, to get along. So eventually, Truman shut down the OSS in September 1945 and parceled out its functions to the State Department and the White House. Truman eventually formed the CIA, as everybody knows, in 1947, modeled largely after Donovan's vision of what that organization should look like. Donovan wanted to head up the CIA. In fact, he had surrogates privately lobby Truman to see if he could become CIA director, but Truman wasn't going to hear, you know, ever consider that. In fact, Donovan had said some nasty things about Truman on the presidential campaign trail, so that wasn't going to happen. When Eisenhower became president, Donovan thought he had his best chance to become CIA director, and again he had surrogates lobby Ike to make him head of the CIA, but. Donovan still didn't have a chance in that case because John Foster Dulles, who was going to be Eisenhower's president, was pushing to have his brother Alan Dulles uh, head up the CIA, and Dulles slid right in to be uh, CIA chief. Donovan was deeply disappointed over that. He thought Dulles, who had worked for him, headed up his station in Bern, Switzerland, and done some amazing operations. He still thought Dulles was a uh, poor administrator and was going to be a disaster at the CIA. Why don't I leave it? Uh, we'll stop right there.
answer any questions you have. We can talk about what Donovan then did after the war, his legacy, uh, what it meant for the agency today, because it's still heavily debated by uh, historians today. They still argue over, you know, w you know, whether what he and his agency did were really worthwhile in World War II. So. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm interested if you find uh, the names of those uh, fancy cities late, late, uh, later in Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, that uh, names of those people and before, particularly from Yugoslavia. I tell you why. Mm -hmm. Because that was a time before coup, right. which uh, knocked down uh, the Well, in, in Bulgaria, first off. Oh, okay. Uh, this was uh, the relations are, uh, with Bulgaria, the operations there, and also Yugoslavia. Uh, Donovan and the OSS, or and his when he visited, I think uh, Bulgaria too. And Yugoslavia. And and Yugoslavia also. In the case of Bulgaria, when Donovan visited there, he uh, visited with King Boris of Bul right. Bulgaria. Uh, he found King Boris to be a fairly frightened creature, well, understandably because King Boris had uh, German divisions from Romania uh, poised at his border ready to uh, invade. Boris thought uh, Donovan was a knucklehead, uh, thought he was very naive uh, about uh, you know, the Balkan situation. And the Balkan, as you probably know, is a, is a cauldron of different types of competing politics uh, and uh, Boris thought Donovan was entering into a place he really didn't know much about. And, and the reason I found out about that was because Boris told that to the German ambassador after Donovan left, that this guy, you know, is clueless. Uh, and he, he had a low opinion of him. In Yugoslavia, uh, again, it was a cauldron of different competing factions. You had, you know, the Croatian faction supporting the Nazis, you had Tito's partisans, you had the Chetniks under uh, Mihailovic, uh, and Donovan, basically the British were in there first. In fact, they were very upset that Donovan was barging his way into there uh, with uh, his operatives. Churchill was moving aid from Mihailovic to uh, Tito's partisans, and Donovan basically wanted to have spies planted with all the camps. And he had some very fierce fights with Churchill and with uh, Roosevelt over trying to get his men, men in there. Eventually, everything shifted to Tito's partisans. Uh, Churchill insisted on it, and Roosevelt uh, would not uh, fight him on that issue. At one point, Donovan proposed to have himself parachute into Yugoslavia. He never actually really did. Churchill thought that was a horrible idea and told Roosevelt that, basically took him to the woodshed on it. Uh, and Churchill, I mean, Roosevelt backed off. Uh, and in the end, uh, Tito's partisans basically kicked everybody out uh, as the Soviets moved in. World War II. Oh, it was. In the beginning of the World War II, until 1943. Right. Yes, he did. Uh, he did, in fact, and talked with the senior Air Force general. I don't have his name in my head. Uh, and it was just after that. Yes, yeah, Simovich, right. It was just after that then that Hitler in, invaded Yugoslavia. Goebbels claimed that uh, the reason Hitler invaded was because Donovan went in there and filled Simovich's ears and the, uh, the rebel uh, Yugoslav leader, military leaders with all these promises that uh, Franklin Roosevelt was going to come to their aid and was just stirring things up. Uh, and it was a bunch of baloney. He, he didn't, he, when you read the transcripts of what he actually said, he was very, very careful uh, and stuck to his talking points that the uh, U.S. and the British ambassador had drafted for him. Even so, the conservative press in the United States, conservative magazines, bought the German line and criticized Donovan heavily for uh, being the instigator of the Soviet invasion, I mean, the, uh, the German invasion of Yugoslavia. So it became kind of a messy affair for him. Yeah. 
Good question. Uh, they had a problem, particularly with uh, little Augie cigarettes. Okay, they couldn't figure out because what the ultimate goal, and the Army was very, very in interested in it. They helped fund it too, uh, because what they wanted to do was use it. For example, if they had somebody who might be a mole or whatever, they wanted to have a way to give it to someone unwittingly, so they really didn't know they were getting it, and they weren't sure about <coughs> little Augie because after the second sessions of smokes. Uh, he started wondering, you know, why am I so, why is this such a terrific meeting I'm having with this guy all the time? Uh, Donovan, though, was, uh, was very, very intensely interested. In fact, he had Cornell University do some experimental work, uh, continued on it. And they tried all kinds of drug, drugs from marijuana to mescaline and everything else. Never got anything really off the ground so they could use it on a mass production basis. But he put a lot of money into it. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, and is there any uh, function out there, organization that's similar to the OSS of the 40s? I'll just repeat the question. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, the question is, could uh, Donovan exist in the CIA today, or is there any function out there uh, in the U.S. intelligence community like the uh, uh, OSS today? I've always kind of uh, said somewhat tongue-in-cheek that the Pentagon and the CIA could use a Wild Bill Donovan, just not two of them, right? <laughs> Uh, I think he would have had a tough time, although there is an intense debate if you read uh, op-ed pages, scholarly journals, particularly the military press, over whether uh, the CIA and also the U.S. Special Operations Command, which is headquartered in Tampa, Florida, should uh, consider you know, the idea of returning to its roots, uh, to its OSS roots in kind of those swashbuckling days. Uh, in fact, I was down actually in Tampa last month at a uh, conference that the commander of the U.S. Special Operations Command was having on this very subject, you know, should we, uh, you know, return to our OSS roots, and there's a debate within the CIA on it. M you know, uh, that was a fun period back then, but we've got, you know, 70 years have passed. Uh, it's, you know, we live in a different world today. Uh, I said at one audience one time it's be, be, be like the U.S. Army you know saying what we need is a good horse cavalry charge nowadays but then I thought well, wait a minute in Afghanistan we had CIA officers covert officers on horses leading charges so maybe that that analogy didn't work but uh, I you know I say the, the targets are, are are somewhat different today you still see some of the same failures uh, I think you know Donovan wanted men and I say men because there were only about 4,500 or about 4,000 women in his group. Uh, some of them were, uh, were agents. He paid them more than the regular federal government did. But it was still a glass ceiling, so he always referred to them as his men. But he wanted men of, quote, disciplined daring. And I think the two words are very important. You know, you have to have daring, but you also have to have discipline. Uh, and what you learn from looking at the history is that uh, – yeah, it would be nice to have, you know, you, you need an intelligence service with discipline, daring, with the spirit, the elan, the esprit de corps that you saw with Wild Bill Donovan. Uh, but you do need the discipline. You need control by the President of the United States. So it's kind of a roundabout non-answer, wasn't it? <laughs> hey. Um, I had dinner with uh, someone who had met Donovan mm -hmm. last night, and she, her father was Mm -hmm. And she was telling me a story about, and she told it convinced that she had beat him at chess. And I was wondering you know, how much he uh, might have interacted uh, very personally with members of the administration's family and, and so on. Um, and, and I'm just wondering if there's anybody here who actually knew him personally or if you talked with people that uh, knew him well. The question is. Uh uh, Donovan's interaction first with uh, Roosevelt, uh, if I talked to any people who knew Donovan well, uh, also did he play chess? Uh, okay. On the chess playing, I don't, don't know about that. He played bridge. He learned to play bridge in the mid-1930s uh, and played it a lot uh, afterwards. He usually lost. He, he was not a very good bridge player. Uh, he had a complicated relationship with uh, the Roosevelt White House. Uh, 
uh, and Roosevelt himself. Keep in mind, Donovan is you know, a prominent uh, conservative Republican uh, for his day. I mean, he was an internationalist, but he was still domestically, he was conservative. Roosevelt had brought into his cabinet, because he formed a coalition cabinet going into the war, much like what uh, Churchill did. He brought in Frank Knox as Secretary of the Navy, Henry Stimson as Secretary of the War, both uh, prominent Republicans, and Donovan as his top spy master, uh, a prominent Republican mentioned, still mentioned when he joined Roosevelt's cabinet as a possible presidential candidate. So there were a lot of people inside the White House, and in fact you read some of their letters here at the Library of Congress, uh, and they are kind of worried, like, hey, you know, what are we doing here, setting up a farm team for future presidential candidates that are going to run against uh, Franklin Roosevelt? So there was some suspicion there. Even Eleanor had some suspicion of uh, Donovan coming in uh, initially, uh, although Donovan worked assiduously to smooth uh, Ele Eleanor, to cultivate her. Donovan, for his part, never really wanted to be Franklin Roosevelt's friend, never wanted to get too close to him. He thought it was kind of a moth to the flame type of situation that he'd get caught in. Uh, he saw a lot of top aides to Roosevelt uh, get burned up if they got really too close to him. And Roosevelt himself really was never close to any of his aides. He kept them all in the dark on f some of the things they were doing. I mean, if you read the papers of Harry Hopkins, the other, Steve Early, uh, they all didn't know completely what Donovan, uh, I mean, what Roosevelt was doing. Neither did Donovan. Roosevelt had a secret spy unit uh, that was set up basically behind Donovan's back. Uh, it was run by a guy named John Franklin Carter, who was a columnist here, a newspaper columnist in Washington. In fact, continued to write his column while he ran a secret uh, off-the-books operation for uh, Roosevelt out of the White House. Donovan only learned about it when he was interviewing one guy, asked him to join his own organization, said, no, I can't do it. I'm working for uh, Carter's organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. So very, very complex. Two more questions. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did he ever use codes or invisible ink drop-off? Oh, yeah, they experimented on that. Uh, invisible ink. Uh, the question is, did he ever use codes, invisible inks, uh, dead drops, that sort of thing? Yeah, and they had to learn as they go. Stanley Lovell uh, perfected invisible ink that you could not only write on paper, but also on your undershirt, you know, and so you could take it out. You know, if you were captured, nobody would see it. Uh, they, everybody, every officer had uh, overseas, particularly the espionage ones, had codes. In fact, they had so many number codes that they had a hard time keeping track of who was who in the codes. They called it a numbers racket. Uh, and in fact, they insisted that a lot of these guys who really weren't truly undercover didn't need a code. You know, it was great to cool to have a code, you know, if you, particularly if it was a lower ranking, num lower number near Donovan's. Uh, Dulles's code was 110. Uh, and then that meant you were, you know, you were a cool spy. Uh, yeah, one of Right. Uh, the question is uh, The Good Shepherd and the portrayal of uh, Donovan by Robert De Niro. I know that upset uh, a number of people within the OSS, the OSS Society, uh, they, and there are about 500 former OSSers who are still alive. In fact, I need to answer your other question that I, I've talked to a number of them who knew Donovan, and there are only a few actually are still alive who knew, knew Donovan. Uh, the, an Italian-American actor playing an Irish-American, you know, Glad hander, they thought that didn't really come off. So there was a you know a lot of concern uh, over the portrayal of that movie. Last question. Last question. Okay. Uh, what about the uh, charge by um, Robert Wilcox that uh, Donovan was involved in uh, an actual assassination of uh, General uh, Patton? Uh, the question is, was Donovan involved in an assassination of uh, General Patton? And that's circulated in the internet uh, for a long time. There's no truth to it. Uh, Donovan and Patton actually were big buddies. Uh, they were next door neighbors. Patton had a home in uh, Middleburg, Virginia, and Donovan had a country home in uh, Berryville, Virginia. They used to pal around together a lot. And Patton liked uh, Donovan, and Donovan liked, liked Patton. They, uh, when Patton invaded Sicily, they, uh, Donovan met him at Gala. Sicily, where they had a you know a lunch of cold sea rations and you know talked to old times. So no, there's no evidence that was ever the case. Thank you very much. Uh, we are going to conclude with just a little footnote on the Library of Congress and the OSS. Doug mentioned that the a lot of the research was done 
at the Library of Congress. I'd always heard about this unit and never checked into it as somebody who's interested in the library's history, but today, inspired by our speaker, I got busy in the 1943 annual report, and there in the finance section, it has the numbers. Of this total major portion of money spent in 1943 on government-directed research, 391,852 was made available by the Coordinator of Information, now the Office of Strategic Services for the Division of Special Information, which was established by the library in September 1941 to provide service to that agency. During fiscal 1943, the division was liquidated and the personnel transferred to the staff of the Office of Strategic Services. However, a special and restricted reading room of room reading room service for OSS is still maintained on funds transferred for this purpose. This is June of 43. Then over in the finance section, there's something about the space use, which I'd never seen before. It said the research and analysis branch of the OSS services occupied the full length and subsequently half the length of this whole floor on the annex. So it was a substantial research outfit that uh, research service that the Library of Congress provided for the OSS. And that was because of Archibald McLeish, who was the Librarian of Congress, who was part of the war effort and I know a good friend of Donovan's. Let's thank our speaker again. We're going to sign books outside. <laughs> and you'll have a chance to answer, get some answers for some of those many, many questions. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.